Awesome. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, quick overview of kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, we are going to, I'm going to start with an overview of the community based transportation planning webinar or uh, set aside. Um, talk a little bit about purpose and goals, um, go over types of projects that would be eligible and the types of um, organizations that can um, submit letters of interest and then just um, cover some of the requirements we anticipate and additional details. Um, I will kind of flash one um, example, quick example from our pilot program that we're doing with Edgewater and then definitely should have plenty of time at the end to take questions. Um, just final note, we will be recording this and sending it out afterwards. So if you want to share it with anyone, um, feel free to pass that along. I'll probably email it to registrants a day or two afterwards. All right. And again, as questions come up, feel free to pop those into the chat. Um, I might be able to take some kind of midstream, but we should have plenty of time at the end also to answer any questions that you have. Um, okay, so what is our tech community-based transportation planning um, set aside? So this is a new technical assistance program um, that we are starting up. We, we have piloted this program, so you may have heard of it before. Um, we piloted it last year with a little bit smaller source of funds. Um, and now the program is kind of being formalized as part of our 2024 to 2027 set aside. So we do have two and a half million dollars uh, available for these projects over that four year period, 2024 to 2027. And those are the federal fiscal years. So started a month ago <laughs> or so. Um, we are planning on splitting that dollar amount into uh, two two year funding cycles. So we're gonna have two calls for projects anticipated. Um, each call for projects we're thinking will be around 1.25 million, but we'll kind of see, um, it'll be a little bit of flexibility there. Um, and then most importantly, there is no local match required for these funds. So we actually have um, worked with CDOT to kind of use toll credits and remove the local match. Um, and then last, I will just kind of note that these projects um, must be within the Dr. Cog Metropolitan Planning Organization boundary. So that's this green shaded, um, part of the map here. So any county, city, community within this kind of green area would be eligible for a project um, using these funds. So just quickly, if you guys aren't familiar with what our set aside program is, just to kind of F kind of orientation, um, Dr. Cog gets a number of funds, uh, federal funds that are we use and, and distribute through our call for projects. So this is those are our transportation improvement funds. Normally we have call for projects and those are sorted into the regional pot and the sub-regional pot. Different jurisdictions can apply and then those are approved by the board. So the set-asides are a little different in that we're still using our federal funds, um, but rather than doing kind of a formal call for projects and then distributing those funds directly to member jurisdictions, we actually have them set aside for programmatic uses. Um, so they the funds are directly kind of allocated through the different set-asides, and then um, the Dr. Cog board makes the kind of official approval of projects. So for the community-based transportation planning program, um, this is one of a number of set-asides that we have, um, and we have a couple specific goals for this new program. Um, we're looking to expand um, access to opportunity for residents of all ages and incomes, um, we're looking to support our member governments in their efforts to improve mobility. So this is a kind of a key thing. I, we see this as kind of a form of technical assistance. Um, we are focused specifically on the needs of disproportionately impacted and marginalized communities in the region. So that's kind of a really important focus of the program and all projects should be focused on um, a community that has been disproportionately impacted or marginalized in some way. Um, and then kind of our last goal because of that because of the focus of the program, a big focus is gonna be um, in centering the, vo the voices of those kind of marginalized communities to make sure that the projects and studies and recommendations that come out of this program speak to, to those communities. So that's really important and, and why community, community is in the name set aside. Um, all right, so who can submit letters of interest? Um, this program, like I said, is, is a little different than our formal transportation improvement program. We're not having 
a formal call for projects where jurisdictions submit a multi-step application. We are having instead a letter of interest process, which is a little bit less formal. We're trying to make it a little bit easier for folks. Um, those letters of interest, which are open right now, can be submitted by any local jurisdiction, again, within the Dr. Cog MPO boundary, so that green shaded area on the, the earlier map. That can be cities or counties. Um, we are also allowing any regional agency to submit a letter, so that would probably most likely be CDOT or RTD or the Regional Air Quality Council. Um, and then last, a uh, slight different from our pilot program, we are allowing letters of interest to be submitted directly by nonprofit organizations. So this could be TMAs, could be universities, could be community organizations. Um, th those organizations will need to be a formally, you know, 501 c 3 or otherwise formally established organizations. Um, and if a letter is coming from a nonprofit organization, that letter of interest will require a letter of support from the impacted local jurisdiction. So if you are, for example, in the city of Edgewater and you're a nonprofit and you want to submit a letter of interest, that's great, but you would need the city of Edgewater in that case to submit um, a letter of support for your letter of interest. All right, so what type of projects could fit into this program? Um, we actually wanted to keep this pretty broad. So um, any type of transportation study or planning effort would be eligible for this program, as long as that effort is related and centers the historically marginalized communities. So um, there's a list here of different types. There's probably more that aren't on this list. Um, a few kind of clear notes here. So these are planning funds. So we won't be able to do construction. We won't be able to do um, detailed design. We're going to be sticking to the planning um, and or study phase of any project. Um, and then again, the key for all of these is that the, the focus of the, of the study or the plan should be on um, one of the historically or on the historically marginalized community that you identify in your letter of interest. Um, but there are a number of different types, anything related to transportation, corridor plans, sub-area plans, first last mile studies, um, school plans, um, et cetera. Um, a couple kind of key elements we wanna make sure are in all um, projects. So, you know, these are kind of related. Um, we do wanna, again, make sure that the studies are centering those historically marginalized communities. So you can identify that community in your letter of interest, but that community should then kind of be the, the group we're thinking about in doing the study uh, related to that, because we know some of the often marginalized communities are hard to, or don't necessarily have time or money or um, knowledge to participate in kind of traditional community engagement at a meeting at five o'clock. Um, we do want to focus on extensive community engagement. Um, we're open to a lot of different ways of doing this, but community engagement should be a major part of each of the studies or projects. Um, and then the third kind of key element we're looking at is we want these projects to be implementation oriented. Um, we don't wanna just do a study that sits on a shelf. We want these studies and, and um, plans to really help identify projects and help um, a, a local community move um, forward specific projects or programs so that mobility can be improved for um, the community members. So. That's part of why we require the letter of interest for the nonprofit, um, the letter of support, sorry, from the nonprofits is to just make sure if we're re recommending infrastructure or programs that would have to be run by governments, that the governments are at least on the same page and, and willing to help kind of participate and, and support those projects. Um, I did want to have add a kind of a note about what we mean by historically disadvantaged. And I'm kind of using a couple terms um, interchangeably. Um, Part of that is because we are allowing the person or the organization submitting the letter of interest to define for themselves what historically disadvantaged, historically marginalized um, equity community they would like to focus on. There's kind of two main ways you can do that. Um, you could do one or both of these. So first would be a quantitative analysis. So using a demographic tool uh, to say that this community you're focused on is low income or has a higher proportion of communities of color or something like that. Um, the second option would be to um, do a qualitative description. So we know that um, 
you know, the demographic and census tract analysis doesn't capture every everything and kind of the nuances of each community. So if you if there's a community that maybe doesn't hit all the census tract kind of numbers, um, but you still know of a specific community within that area, um, you can also describe um, how the target community has been historically disadvantaged. Um, I am going to take a, a brief interlude here to show you the Dr. Cog Equity Index. Um, so let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Um, so if you aren't, hopefully you're seeing this. If not, chat at me. <laughs> um, so the, if you aren't familiar with the Dr. Cog Equity Index, Had my headphone fall out. Um, if you aren't familiar with the Dr. Cog Equity Index, um, and Jennifer, I see you have your hand up. Let me see if I let you speak here. Um, yeah, Jennifer, you can talk if you have a question. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Nora. I just wanted to let you know the chat seems to be disabled. So if you're looking oh, for good to know, that might not be an option. At least it's not for me. So. Oh, perfect. I think I fixed it. So perfect. try now. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Thanks for for interrupting and letting me know. <laughs> um. Okay. So the Dr. Craig Equity Index. I just wanted to flash this for folks who who maybe aren't as familiar. It is a new tool that we released in the last um, year or so. I will put the link into the chat, but it's a, a pretty useful tool. There's a lot in here. Um, a lot of the layers that Dr. Cog maintains, a lot of the data we have is within this tool. But I did just want to show you how it would work to use this tool to, sh to look at the demographics and the equity index scores for a certain community. So I did use kind of a rough, a rough example of Edgewater because we were working with them. Um, so if you are in the tool, you can kind of go up to one of these things. Um, you can get nearby statistics, which will allow you to draw a square, a line, or a point. You can also upload a project GIS. Um, once you kind of have drawn your square on the map or your line or have uploaded your project location, there's a lot of then different specific tabs you can look at. One of those is equity data, which again is looking at census data. Our equity index is kind of a compilation of a lot of different data um, layers, which you can see. Um, people with low income, people of color, people over 60. Uh, but if you scroll all the way to the end, you can see um, what the average equity index score for your area is, um, as well as the three domains. So our equity index score is basically made up of three buckets. Um, each of those buckets is scored individually, and then they're rolled up together into a final score. So if we're looking at the city of Edgewater, roughly, I know this isn't their exact boundary, we could say um, this area, um, Usually the scores are up to 45 or so. So this area has a very high um, score for economic domain, which means there's probably a lot of low income people in this area. It has a medium score for mobility domain. So those are whether or not the people in the community might have mobility barriers. And then it has kind of a, a medium high score for race and national origin, indicating there might be more people of color. So in the letter of interest for Edgewater, we could cite some of these stats and say, um, this, this blue section in particular is in the top quartile um, for the total equity index score compared to the region as a whole. But um, Edgewater in this case could also say, well, even though you know maybe some of these areas have a lower score, we know that there's a specific group of folks that we want to focus on that maybe um, aren't represented entirely by the data. So again, I'll put this uh, um, link into the chat. Um, it's a great tool. And if you have more detailed questions about this, I can certainly connect you with folks with it, Dr. Cog, who can answer that. So back to the presentation here. Um, couple expectations that we just wanted to highlight. Um, with these projects, these are uh, unique among our set-asides. We have four set-asides um, that are functioning in a similar way, but essentially the way it's gonna work is the funds will stay with Dr. Cog. So Dr. Cog is gonna fully fund these projects. As I said, there's no local match. Dr. Cog is also going to manage procurement and serve as project manager. Um, included in that is we will be the entity getting the um, IGA with CDOT. So 
trying to keep it as simple as possible for um, the the folks who submit letters of interest, the kind of jump calling project sponsors. Um, we do have some expectations. We don't want to do these projects in a vacuum. So if you are submitting a letter of interest, um, kind of what the minimum of what we expect from from those organizations would be, um, if selected, your organization will need to submit a letter of understanding and project commitment from senior leadership. We are finalizing this, but I should have it available if you're curious what it looks like. Um, you would only need to submit this after your project has been selected. So in January, um, I will be sending these out and asking you to get a signature. Um, if you're a city or a county, we are going to be looking for the senior elected official. Um, if you're a nonprofit organization, it would be from an executive director. I can certainly work with you if that's unfeasible, but we just want to make sure that um, your organization or your agency is fully committed to participating in the project. Um, we will then kind of be expecting the project sponsor to attend monthly meetings, share data if that's applicable, and kind of broadly support community engagement. Um, and then I will note, if you want to be more engaged, happy to have you be as you know fully engaged, um, attend every single meeting, but these are kind of the, the minimums that we're expecting. Um, so just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about selection criteria. Um, we, uh, I'll, in a second here, I'll flash our schedule, but um, once our letters of interest are submitted, we are gonna have a selection panel, which will include probably Dr. Cog staff, potentially staff from CDOT and RTD, um, reviewing those letters of interest and essentially scoring each of them. Um, so those scores are gonna be made up by these different categories. Um, I will note that community need level of disadvantage and community engagement ideas are gonna be heavily weighted. So that would be half of the score, um, but we're also looking at uh, whether or not the project aligns with Metro Vision, aligns with the regional transportation plan, um, and then generally whether or not the project is ready in terms of, you know, are the local partners committed? Is there kind of, uh, can we hit the ground running? Um, and then last, planning needs. So is there kind of a clear need for some additional study or planning on this topic or on this project? Um, and then uh, last, last slide on details. Um, just our upcoming timeline. Um, and Jennifer, did you have another question or is your hand just still up from before? I'm sorry, it's just up from before. I didn't realize it before. <laughs> okay. My apologies. <laughs> no worries, just wanted to make sure I wasn't ignoring you. No, I appreciate um, that. So upcoming timeline. So we do have a letter of interest open now. It's on the website on Dr. Cog. Um, it will be open through the end of the calendar year. So we're asking those to be sent in to us by November or December 31st, 2023. There's an online form you can use to submit those, or you, if you prefer, there's also a, I think a Word document you could fill out and send in to us. We don't have word limits you know, on those um, or character limits, but we are asking, um, you know, consider your selection committees, uh, you know, keep them, you know, concise and to the point as much as possible, but make sure you can get all the information in there that you want to have in there. Um, if you are pretty certain you're going to submit a letter of interest, would love to also have a meeting with you just to kind of learn about your project, um, answer any questions one on one. So you can email me to get those set up, um, preferably before December 31st, but you know, a little flexibility there if that's impossible. Um, in January, that selection committee I mentioned is going to be reviewing projects. Um, we will then be ranking projects as opposed to making an official selection. Um, the reason we're doing this is because the letter of interest doesn't isn't a formal scope for a project. So we don't we recognize that we won't have finalized budgets for every project um, after the letter of interest phase. There is a question within the letter of interest asking you to estimate what you think the project budget would be um, based on your best knowledge. And if you have questions about that, I'm certainly happy to to talk through that question with your organization. But um, the idea is that the, the ranked list would be approved by our um, technical advisor committee, the regional transportation committee, and the Dr. Cog board. And then once the list is approved, we will start with the top of the list, kind of going through and working on an official scope and starting procurement. And, and that will allow us to determine exactly how many dollars are needed. And then we'll continue adding, you know, selecting projects until the funds, um, the $1.25 million run out. So. Um, that kind of gives us, there'll be a little bit of flexibility to kind of get as many projects in as possible um, without knowing exactly what the dollar amount of each project is when 
um, when they are evaluated. Um, like I said, the, our, our technical, we have a three committee system. So these projects will need to be um, approved by all three of those um, boards and committees, um, probably in the, the February, March, maybe in April, depending on kind of time, time frame. Um, and then we are hoping to start kind of that procurement and budgeting um, process in the second quarter of next year so that we can kind of start kicking off projects in the summer. Um, I will note we are we may stage some, so we might start with a couple and kind of wait three months to get started on another. We'll, we'll kind of work that out with the projects that are selected. So before we go to questions, I did want to just kind of briefly share kind of what we're doing in our pilot program. Maybe it jostles some ideas, um, but it's been so far we're off to a good start. We did select two projects for our pilot program. So our first is in Edgewater, and the second is a kind of first last mile study in um, Westminster and Adams County, which we're gonna be starting in January. So the Edgewater um, Community-Based Transportation Plan, um, it's kind of a school transportation plan. So we're looking at improving safety and traffic around two elementary schools, um, which you can see here in the little map. Um, this project was selected, I think, for a number of reasons. First of all, Edgewater, particularly the attendance of these school, these three schools um, are, uh, majority Spanish speaking, majority low income. Um, there's a lot of kind of different challenges with some of these communities. Um, so we felt like there was a high need and, and certainly um, some of the communities haven't been included in past planning efforts. Um, additionally, the part of this project is looking at a recent st school closure. So this area in kind of dashed was where the mole home school um, used to work operate. Um, it was recently closed at the end of last school year. So a lot of these students are now having to cross Colfax, cross the dry gulch to get to school, presenting kind of additional transportation challenges. Um, and this Southern section um, kind of has even higher equity index scores. So we know a lot of those folks don't have access to cars and have other kind of mobility barriers to, to get to school. So that was the focus. Here's kind of how the project is set up. So we are providing funding and doing kind of coordinating. Um, we're also kind of playing a larger role in engagement on this project. We are working kind of with two, two groups that are formally under contract. So Y2K Engineering is doing the um, planning and engineering work, but we also have Edgewater Collective under contract. They're a, a local community organization and they um, are contracted to help with um, engagement as well as translation, um, and they work a lot with the, the school community, particularly the Spanish-speaking community in Edgewater. Um, and then, of course, the city of Edgewater is kind of the, the primary partner, um, agency partner, so we're, we're working closely with them, and then if the as well as the Jeffco Public Schools. So just an example of kind of how it could be set up. Um, you know, the project scope, nothing too crazy. Um, you can see we have a pretty extensive engagement um, bucket for the scope, uh, working closely with Edgewater Collective. Um, we've been doing focus groups. They're working with their kind of people they already um, serve, website, social media, pop-up, um, those sorts of things. Um, we're also doing you know existing conditions analysis, technical analysis, and then we're putting together a final plan with recommendations for the schools um, and for kind of the community more broadly. So just a quick example to kind of highlight what a community-based transportation plan could look like um, but like I said, we're open to a lot of um, variety and, and creativity and kind of how these are set up and what the focus is. So with that, that's the end of my formal presentation, but would love to see if there are any questions. Um, I 